as I sat in the audience earlier, that this is, I think, it's been about 10 years that I've been coming to Society of Editors conferences in various guises. And one of the things that's fascinating to me is the way in which press freedom has moved increasingly closer to the centre of what the Society of Editors and you as a group and we as a community talk about. Three years ago, I was lucky to chair a panel that looked at press freedom threat threats we would like to outside of the UK. Well. I'm sure there'll be a number, but we'll, we'll certainly be. And what we're now looking at in this panel is the challenges that the press face in the UK and the threats faced by our free press and a free media uh, for journalists working here, something that I think a lot of people took for granted even a couple of years ago. Um, I have a fantastic panel to do this, and as I said, it might be a stretch to do it in an hour, but we will, with these brains, I think, hopefully come up with some suggestions about how we can go forward in terms of protecting the media in the UK. So, on my left, I have John Battle. Many of you will know him. He's head of compliance at ITN, the TV production company that produces ITV News, Channel 4 News, and 5 News. He advises editorial teams on issues like libel, contempt of court, copyright, data protection, privacy, and the Ofcom Broadcasting Code. Martin Breen has been editor of Sunday Life newspaper in Belfast since 2009. Its investigations have exposed numerous criminal and terrorist elements, and his reporters face several terrorist threats due to their work, something we will highlight and talk about shortly. He's also a board member of the Society of Editors. Elizabeth Denham is the Information Commissioner. The IOC is the UK's regulator for data protection and information rights, and it enforces the law uh, when organisations have violated data protection rules. It also provides guidance on uh, laws such as uh, GDPR, which I've become overly familiar with in recent years. Um, and finally, John Whittingdale, who's absolutely not an MP. Please... Please cross that bit off of your programmes, but it is the Conservative candidate for Malden in Essex. Um, you will know that for a decade he was Chairman of the House of Commons uh, Culture, Media and Sport Select Committee. He was Secretary of State for Culture, Media and Sport 2015 to 2016. And he is seemingly chair of a very large number of all, parla <laughs> all party parliamentary groups. But for this uh, session, the important one, I think, is the newly formed All party parliamentary group on media freedom. So, let's kick off by just highlighting what for you individually you see as the major threats to press freedom here in the UK at the moment. John. Uh, th thank you, Jodie. Um, well, there's, there's quite a lot that we, we face, and I think the title of the conference is really apposite, isn't it? Defending media freedom. It's really important for us as part of the journalistic community to recognise what we're trying to defend. Um, whether it be edit editorial independence, um, protecting sources, and ensuring safety of our journalists, and, and finally ensuring that the public are properly informed what's going on in society. So though it can't be said loud enough the importance of actually defending basic journalistic freedoms. So what do we face uh, going forward? Now, you can see from the talks today there's various different themes that seem to be uh, rising. One of them, I think, is to do with official secrets, that the, the talk to do that uh, was given by Neil Basu just now. Um, quite soon there will be a, an outcome to a consultation from the Law Commission, with, which they talked about changing, reforming the Official Secrets Act. Now, the Official Secrets Act, 1911 and uh, 1989, have on the whole served journalists well. There are very few prosecutions of journalists, and that's because within that uh, act, you actually, prosecutors have to prove damage. They have to prove damage for, for third parties, not individuals, public servants, or those who've signed the Official Secrets Act, but a journalist as a third party for disclosing official secrets, damage has to be proved. And that's quite a difficult hurdle to be uh, jumped. The Law Commission was suggesting that that should be taken away, that you wouldn't actually have to prove uh, damage. Therefore, if there is to be change, we have to protect our freedoms, to protect the, the defence that we've got, including introducing a public interest defence. There is no public interest defence within the Official Secrets Act at the moment. So that's the first thing on the horizon, Official Secrets. The second thing is 
the relationship with the police. And I, I'm very interested in uh, what Neil said about partnership with the, uh, the press and partnership with news organisations. But the fact is there has been recently um, a number of applications made by police for footage of interviews concerning interviews between journalists and broadcasters and news organisations. This has led to police applications in the Crown Court. ITN had its application concerning an interview with Shamima Begin, one of our reporters, Rohit Kachru, where he travelled out to Syria, interviewed her, and then this was in the wake of Anthony Lloyd, the Times journalist, and when we got back, uh, the, we were asked for our uh, material, unbroadcast material, we said, well, we're independent, the... It, such interviews wouldn't necessarily happen without, if we were seen as being on the side of the police, we have to be at arm's length with the police, we're independent, we're independent television news. And there was a contested application where we were with The Times and we were also with Sky News as well, and we won. And the, the judge in the Old Bailey said that the importance of journalism is such that it wasn't on the circumstances merited for the material to be handed over. So that's another challenge, police asking for our material, and uh, that can have an effect on our perception of independence. The other challenge, I think, and I'd be interested to hear what Elizabeth says, is, is data protection. That's been the, the big issue, I think, for media lawyers of the last uh, few years. What I find really interesting about data protection is that Everyone talks about GDPR, but actually, data, data protection has been around for a long time, since 1998, and it hasn't really had a deep effect on journalism. Recently, with GDPR, people have become much more alive to what it means. I think that's partly to do with investigations carried out for, by Channel 4 News and others uh, about Cambridge Analytica. But there is some guidance that's going to be uh, given by the Data Protection Commissioner about um, the way she looks at journalism. It has to be said the 2014 guidance, which was introduced by her predecessor, Christopher Graham, I think was overall a fair document. I would, I would hope that going forward, that document from 2014 would not be changed significantly um, because it has served, I think, both the Data Protection uh, Information Commissioner's Office and the uh, journalists reasonably well. So those are the challenges that lie ahead. There's three that I'd throw into the, into the mix. Okay. Martin, we talked about police, national security, data protection. What, what do you see as an editor as the key threat to press freedom? Just following on from what John said, we've obviously had a very high profile case in, in Northern Ireland. Um, a film was made called No Stone Unturned about an atrocity 25 years ago when six people were killed in a bar watching a World Cup match. Uh, a documentary was done on why nobody had been ever brought to justice for it. Um, the two filmmakers, two journalists, uh, Trevor Burney and Barry McCaffrey, they um, put in the public domain a document from the police ombudsman in Northern Ireland which allowed them to name the suspected killers. And within weeks of that uh, the film airing, um, they were subject to dawn raids. They had millions of documents taken away, some of which still are on police systems in, in Northern Ireland. And um, they had to go to the High Court. To Eventually, the warrant was deemed inappropriate, um, that the grounds on which it was originally granted under the Official Secrets Act was flawed. And they have had all the paperwork and physical disks returned, such as um, one of them was their, one of their teenage daughter's GCSE work was on a lollipop USB drive. Um, so that took 10 months to be returned. Obviously, her GCSEs were probably finished by that stage. Um, th th it's still ongoing in that, I think, of the countless number of documents, it was, it was, it's in the millions as far as, as, far as, as, far as they know. They haven't um, got an exact number as yet. But I think 3% of what was seized related to the Lock and Island investigation there was other stuff on a clerical sex abuse investigation, which um, would have obviously included um, witness statements and things like that that they had collated for, for their documentaries. And as I understand it, there was also research into documentaries for uh, films that were going to take place in other countries, like places like Honduras, where you know, it, journalists are severely under physical threat as well. So source protection suddenly became a, a huge worry for them. And, and in terms of physical violence, obviously, sadly, Northern Ireland was the place where we had a journalist killed this year. Is that something that you're sensing is on back on the increase, that journalists are physically threatened? 
Well, it, 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 it is. It's, it's happening quite a lot. It has been happening. It's an ongoing. It's an ongoing thing um, where you will get. Uh, Earlier this year, um, one of the reporters who works in my team um, sitting down to his Sunday evening dinner and knock at the door, uh, the police delivering a threat and it said he was at risk of imminent attack um, and they basically handed him out a leaflet of how to keep yourself safe and then left, um, which, which then I got involved and tried to reach the chief constable and senior officers to ascertain what the threat was about. It did not identify any group. It did not identify any area. Uh, we have a real area, that, a real problem in that we can't, uh, the police won't tell us where a threat originates from. Um, so you don't know. So basically a journalist is being told, look, you could be attacked at, at, at any minute, but they can't change their pattern in where they go or, you know, don't frequent a certain area because the police just won't tell. And the police um, response to me um, was that, we need to protect our sources, but I think that they could be a lot more open than just delivering a threat, ha holding their hands up and said, that's our bit done, and then leaving the journalists to their, their own devices. OK, we'll come back and talk a little bit about uh, potentially police overreach and the role of the courts in both protecting and limiting press freedom. But, Elizabeth, I want to come to you. And, and from where you stand, what do you see as the major threats to press freedom in the UK? Well, um, first of all, I wanted to thank um, ITN, Channel 4 News, and also um, The Observer and, and The Guardian for the big story about Cambridge Analytica and Facebook, because I think that really put data protection on the map. And my team talk about how 2018 was the year that data protection went mainstream. But that, that also means we have hundreds of thousands of complaints and requests. So uh, maybe it's a mixed blessing, but GDPR has become familiar in dinnertime conversation. But I would say, um, from my perspective, remembering that I oversee both freedom of information and data protection, two sides of the same coin, my greatest concern in being a regulator at this time of digital revolution is I worry that we've lost authoritative, objective sources, and that that's a massive impact on our society. And it's a, it, it's a hit to the public who struggle to, to keep the powerful to account. So if we think about what we learned in the university, 1970s, 1980s, when I went to university, we could distinguish between authoritative, objective sources and those that aren't reliable. But now I think people can't always, they can't tell the difference between journalism and mediated news and clickbait. And I think that's a, that's a significant issue. And at the same time, government records have become ephemeral. Um, government decision making by WhatsApp is not a way to have a fulsome record of what's actually happening. So I worry about libraries and archives and government records and people not being able to understand what's happening online. So I think digital citizenry is really, really important. And you've talked about the importance of, or, or the need potentially to expand freedom of information. Do you feel that the, the, the freedoms that were delivered in terms of having access to government data have really been fully explored? Are people exploiting that? Are they able to get their hands on that information? We've got this ability to get to it, but are people using it? I think FOI is, is part of the landscape. Obviously, people in this room and the people who work for you are some of our best customers for freedom of information. Bring appeals to our office. We have about 6,500 appeals a year that we're, we're dealing with. We could take more. Um, but the laws have not kept up with the technology and the other issue, and we tabled a report this year called, um, it's about outsourcing. And the problem is, is that so much government services are delivered by outsourced companies that are not subject to freedom of information, that I think that's a significant issue 
and we've called for the law to be extended to outsourced and contracted providers who are delivering our ordinate, ordinary everyday public services. And that may indeed be something for the new government to think about. John, what do you see from where you sit and all the work that you've done over very many years looking at the regulatory environment, the political environment, the social environment? Where do you now see the big threats to media freedom? Well, I think one should start by saying that press freedom in this country is still quite robust. Um, when we set up the APPG for media freedom, um, it was on the back of the last World Press Freedom report, which showed a really horrifying rise in the number of journalists who died in the course of their carrying out their duties or been imprisoned or harassed. Happily, that doesn't happen in this country, at least very rarely. But I was also quite concerned to find that we were, I think, number 35. And <clears throat> that begged the question, why were we not number one? And there were a number of things flagged up, and we talked about the two journalists in Northern Ireland, which was one um, matter of considerable concern. Uh, it's still ongoing, but we had a debate in Parliament, I think just a couple of weeks ago about it. Um, we still have the provision of the Crime and Courts Bill on the statute book. It has not been implemented, but it still sits there. Um, and a less sympathetic government could very easily uh, bring it in should they choose to do so. And there will always be, every now and again, a story appear that people don't like and the cry will go up again uh, for Leveson to, for the implementation of the Crime and Courts Bill or for statutory regulation. But I think that the most immediate concern I have as a threat to press freedom is, is good intentions and unintended consequences. Um, there are some very serious challenges for whichever party becomes the next government in terms of all the online harms um, and to increase protection against some of the things that the Assistant Commissioner was talking about, terrorism, organised crime, self-harm, but we need to be terribly careful. And I expressed some concerns when the White Paper was published because it was drawn in very broad terms um, it could bring in uh, publications that I think were never intended to be covered. And we need to be very careful and measure every uh, policy that is developed in terms of the impact it has on freedom of expression uh, and to make sure that it is proportionate, that it is targeted, um, and much clearer definitions are put in place. Um, there is a huge pressure out there you know, government has to act because we've had some terrible incidents of people being groomed online or people finding out how to harm themselves or the spread of uh, child abuse images. All these things need to be tackled. But at the same time, you always need to bear in mind freedom of expression. And sometimes it means saying, look, these are things we don't like, but actually some of the measures that are being proposed to counter them are more harmful. Um, and so one of the things which I've tried to do is provide that counterbalance against the sometimes rather hysterical pressure uh, that government must step in and immediately appoint new regulators to control uh, the spread of information. We'll come back to online harms because I know that's obviously something that the Information Commission has also uh, expressed views ab about. But given that we've just had uh, the Assistant Commissioner, I, I wanted to start off maybe just quickly by picking up on, on this police point and, and then following up maybe with national security. Martin, from your point of view on what you've seen in Northern Ireland and you talked about the Lachlan Island case, are you concerned potentially that there's police overreach in trying to target journalists? Do, uh, is it a, and is it a lack of understanding? Is it, in this case, perhaps in, in Northern Ireland, a wish to go even further and perhaps cover something else up? And... and uh, uh, is, there a, is there a feeling that police don't necessarily quite understand sufficiently the importance of press freedom? I think, I think it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a, a number of things. In connection with the, the Lock and Island case itself, um, the film had obviously come out. It was very embarrassing for um, police that uh, this was going to a global audience and it was highlighting that nobody had been brought to justice. It highlighted alleged collusion between the killers and the police. Um, 
And the, the one thing that I still can't fathom is what the police expected to find. And, and the, the film had been aired. The, the evidence was out there. The, the document was shown on screen. Um, this was something that dated back 25 years, the, the, the original investigation. It was a police watchdog that had highlighted failings. The, um, there was no imminent need for a raid, from what, from what I can see. And it, it, the families were asking, you know, it, it, it came across. I, I think that probably the police have learned a lesson in that it was such a PR disaster and the families were coming out and, you know, rightly asking why are the resources that could be putting in, that could be put into finding our loved ones killers being put into you know, raids on journalists, seizing their, their goods and, um, you know, putting them tr through a, a year-long court battle where the, the police still haven't admitted it was wrong. They accept that the, 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 the High Court judge is finding that um, it was inappropriate the, um, the, 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 the way it was done. But, you know, the, 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 a lot, as I said earlier, a lot of the material is still there on the police database that was seized and it, it is yet to be decided what will be done with that. John, you talked about the Shamima Bagan case. I mean, back in 2011, I think you were talking about the, the police requesting documentation from the Dale Farm evictions and how they had gone too far there. That's back in 2011. It strikes me that the police still are not cognizant of, their, of, of the protections that exist within law for journalists. And you know, we're still seeing production orders not correctly filled out and so on. Is that something you're encountering? Well, we, I do encounter that a lot. Police are seeking footage from us. I, the starting point is I, I can't blame the police for trying to seek the footage because they're doing their job. They're under a legal obligation to try to get the evidence, to try to find out what material has uh, uh, journalistic organisations have. So I don't think you can blame the police for trying to find out, but I think it's much deeper context than simply us just saying, here we are, you can have that material, um, whether it be Shamima Begum or Dale Farm. Essentially, we want to maintain our independence. We want to be seen to be independent, and I think by doing that, that has a number of ramifications to it. Firstly, I think it means that journalists like to be safer, they like to be viewed as indep independent when they're acting in the field and people are more likely to speak to them rather than being viewed as evidence gatherers for, uh, for the police. Um, and, and, and secondly, in terms of the public being informed about what's going on, we like to be able to speak to people who won't speak to us and won't speak out if we're viewed in some way as being part of the state apparatus. Interesting what Martin said about Lock in Ireland. There's a couple of things that's really important about that case. I think one is that the, the NUJ played a big part in that and they should be given credit for the work they did on behalf of Trevor Burney and, and Barry McCaffrey by raising the profile of, of that issue. But the second thing is I'm, I'm chair of an organisation called the Media Lawyers Association, which is essentially the group of in-house lawyers across the broadcast and newspaper industry. And we were very shocked as a group as to what had happened. And I, I know the film No Stun and Turned as well. I, it was an award-winning film. It won the RTS uh, Northern Ireland uh, Documentary uh, Award. So what happened? The MLA put in a statement on behalf of the media where we talked about our experiences here in England and Wales, saying the proper procedure is to go through the Police and Criminal Evidence Act where you have a judge looking at the facts and we have a right to be heard. That was signed by um, the BBC, but David Atfield, the legal manager of, of the BBC, and that was us contributing to that case. And I, I would like to think that played a little bit of uh, putting some perspective to what had happened in, in Northern Ireland, because otherwise you'd essentially have had Trevor and Barry acting on their own. But by acting collectively, acting as an industry, we were able to say, this is the right way to do it. And what actually has happened here in Northern Ireland is pretty extraordinary. And given that the tests for a judicial review are quite high, someone has to act beyond all reasonable bounds, it was a great victory for well, those two to say, for the court to come down on their side. And we also interviewed in that case with, alongside English Pen, but what struck me, and, and tried to put it in an international context, and when you think about the raids that we saw on the ABC in Australia and the police going in and seizing data, it, it had... It, 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 um, really made me think about that case. But what I reflected on was, if you have access to a lawyer like yourself, an in-house lawyer, 
that, that gives you that strength. But if you're a much smaller organisation, and we've been talking about how we encourage smaller, independent, local journalists, you may, faced with an incorrectly drafted production order, simply just hand the stuff over. That may well be the case, clearly, with lawyers acting for larger news organisations, and they, are, they do have an advantage. Exactly right. I know in the case of Dale Farm, there was an independent camera camera a photographer. He was represented by the NUJ. And again, Trevor and Barry represented by the NUJ as well. So as an individual, there are unions who can help you. But uh, as a production company, it may be more difficult. I want to talk about national security, because it certainly the, seems to us at Index on Censorship to be the case that not just internationally, but in the UK, we're seeing a, a gradual rise in both the amount and the extent of national security legislation that increasingly seems to us to seek to deliberately or accidentally embrace um, journalists in its remit. Is that something that's of concern to you, John? Is that something that you recognise? It's something that I think there has been concern about for a considerable amount of time. Um, you know, I've been in Parliament quite a long time and I can remember uh, the debates around detention orders um, where we were told that the police had to have a power to hold somebody for 28 days, you'll remember, and unless they had this, it was a serious risk that they would be unable to prevent terrorist crimes. And actually, Parliament turned around and said, well, no, you can't have it, because we don't think um, that the, the cost in terms of infringement of civil liberty um, is, is worth paying. Um, and yes, there is great pressure, particularly with the growth of new technology. So, all the different methods of communication which didn't exist you know, just a few years ago. So you've heard my colleague Priti Patel talking about Facebook, um, online message platforms, um, all the different means of communication and the need for, the government will say, the same powers of interception as have always applied in more traditional means. But <clears throat> I think Every time we get these, you need to look very carefully, and it goes back to what I was saying, about ensuring that you are targeting material which everybody would accept the security services need, you know, about communication between terrorists or between child abusers or whatever. But the way that the security forces capture that isn't to have access to the entire of people's communications in the hope that when they find a suspect, they can then go back and there's an enormous database of every, every communication that has taken place. Um, that is, in my view, a step too far. Um, and you know, we have always had uh, a strong um, defence of civil liberties in Parliament, which is why Parliament has said no. The police are under huge pressure to catch criminals, to stop terrorist atrocities. Of course they can know us for these powers. Um, what John was saying right at the beginning about the review of the Official Secrets Act. In each case, Parliament ultimately has the responsibility for drawing the balance. Um, and we have put in place journalistic exemptions in the past, and I hope that we will continue to do so. But sometimes the public pressure um, does, is less keen to protect freedom of speech than uh, I would have hoped. Uh, and I think the parliamentarians have a duty to ensure that we don't lose sight of that priority. You talk about the sort of, if you like, the public demand for protections and perhaps the lessening of enthusiasm for freedom of expression. It's something that we were talking about with Elizabeth earlier. And obviously, one of those things and one of those areas is data and data protection. Elizabeth, I wonder whether you see a risk that people might maliciously use data protection legislation to prevent journalists carrying out investigations? Because it certainly seems from where I sit, we're seeing a, a bubbling up of the use of data protection requests, freedom of information requests, privacy requests, whereas once perhaps we would have seen libel and defamation as a method to prevent publication, that these are methods to potentially stop publishers from publishing. Is that something you're seeing? It's something that I've heard from all of you, and certainly had that, that discussion with the NMA and with others, but the, the case law, the volumes of case law, don't actually bear that out. So I'm, I'm thinking it's more of a fear than an actuality that people that 
that organizations um, that that data protection is the new libel or or defamation. So I'm not sure about that, but there's always been a tension between privacy and freedom of expression, both very important rights, neither unassailable. So it's important to, to remember that. But you're also asking me if I've seen data protection being misused or used as an excuse not to turn over records that subject a public body to accountability. And I would say, yes, I have seen examples of that. Um, when GDPR came in, um, there, was all, there was a lot of scaremongering, even to the point where um, people were saying churches aren't going to be allowed to pray for the sick because of GDPR. Um, there's, but when it's, when it's used as an excuse not to release information, then we will step in and we need to hear about that. And for all of you editors out there, if your journalists run up against that, that's an abuse of the law and it needs to be, it needs to be corrected. And we're happy to step in and do that. More work. <laughs> I want to talk, um, before we open it up, and I want to talk quickly about privacy as well, but I just, I do want to talk about online harms. John raised it. Online harms will come back in some form, I imagine, when the new parliament is installed. It has potentially wide-ranging implications for press freedom. Elizabeth, I think you've suggested potentially a sort of regulator that might be a hybrid of Ofcom and, and the commissioner's office. How is that going to work in practice? How, how are we going to ensure that press freedom is protected and how can something that tries to define harms and offence as widely as the current proposals do possibly protect a free media? You're going to ask me that question during a pre-election period. <laughs> um, what I can say is what I've said in public and what I've said before the parliamentary committee about online harms and I agree with John that this is a very, very, very tricky area because what the white paper is discussing and what parliamentarians are discussing is putting constraint over content that's not illegal but may be offensive. And who is going to be the watchdog of truth? I mean, we're not a content regulator. That's not what we do. I think it's a, it's, it is a very, very tricky issue. It's going to be a noisy debate, as it, as it should be. But I think parliamentarians are under huge pressure because of some of the tragedies yeah. that we've seen in this country. And whatever government, I think, whatever, whoever forms the next government is going to have to look at online harms. But I hope that we have a very evidence-based, vigorous debate because this is a, a tricky area for any regulator to, to enter. John, do you think, and, and Martin as well, I want to ask you, do you think that the news side has been sufficiently alive to the, some of the risks that might come to news operators from regulation of social media? Because it's, there was a lot of cheerleading for regulation of social media a, a while back, as everyone saw this as a wonderful way to get back some revenue for news providers. And I sort of sense now that perhaps people are realising perhaps that wasn't perhaps the most sensible direction. Are people more alive to that now? I think so, but going back, just going back to what Elizabeth was saying about the, the Data Protection Act, I think, which, and whether it has really affected journalism or, or not, I, I think it, it has, has affected journalism, and I think it should be seen in its historical context. That is, you had the Defamation Act 2013, which was brought in by the coalition government, and a real, a real boost for freedom of expression. I think your organisation has played some part in lobbying for that. And there was tests of serious harm, and you thought, this is going to open up investigative journalists. We're going to have more freedom for journalists. So that was brought in 2013. But very soon after that, you've then got the Data Protection Act 2018 and the run-up to that. And so what was gained, to a large extent, in the 2013 Act is lost in the, in the later Act. And that 
obviously within the Data Protection Act, there's no definition of serious harm and there's no limitation period either. So it, it, again, it swings and roundabouts. You win on one and, and you lose on, on the other. Um, in terms of news organisations and media, as, as social media harm, I, I agree, it's, it's an enormous issue. I think the white paper starts the discussion or starts the debate, probably is too, too late. It should have been started earlier because of the, um, you know, what everyone has, has faced. And there will be, I'm sure, some regulation. I think we'll look back on these times and say, we cannot believe what was allowed to go on in 2019 and before in relation to social media. One of the issues arising from this is trolling of journalists. And that is one of the issues that has really been important. It was referred to earlier by James when he was talking about um, uh, recruiting female sports editors. There, there is an issue here about female reporters, female presenters, putting out information and then being then subject to abuse and uh, harassment. And that's not acceptable, so that needs to be addressed. But fundamental to all this is that we cannot forget basic journalistic freedoms. And, and that's the point John has made well, that we cannot throw out what is good about our, our, our society, and that is uh, ensuring protection of sources, independence of the media, and recognise there's something special about journalistic material. Most pieces of legislation, whether it be the Data Protection Act, the Human Rights Act, uh, producing criminal evidence, has that exemptions built into it. I don't think it will be that difficult to, to, to build that into any regulation that is to come. There's always the question is, what is a journalist, which is a difficult one to answer. But I think we now will be going into a period where there will be significant changes, but we do need to stand fast and say what we are here for, to report the news and bring information to the public. That should not be affected by this. Is there a risk, do you think, that people look at you know, the latest uh, moves by Harry and Meghan, for example, to sue various newspapers. We had last year's Cliff Richard case with the BBC that people will look at that and say, actually, nothing's really moved since Leveson. This online harms, for example, gives us an opportunity to introduce tighter regulation. And actually, we need tighter regulation. What do you think, John? Well, I think there'll always be that pressure from people who basically want to have some regulation of newspapers and every now and again a story will appear and even though we may not necessarily like the story that uh, isn't a justification for bringing in regulation i mean i think of something like the ben stokes story which created a lot of anger across the country and of course everybody said well they were you know we should have brought in statutory regulation well i mean i wasn't particularly keen on the Ben Stokes story either, but it didn't, in my view, mean that we should bring in statutory regulation. Um, freedom of the press is a freedom, and sometimes it means that you're going to read things you don't like. Um, I, I think for the moment, the threat of statutory regulation has gone away. I mean, to some extent, Ipso has got to continue to prove itself. Um, Ipso certainly got more credibility than the Press Complaints Commission. Sometimes I think the PCC was unfairly criticised, but it was regarded very widely as being ineffectual. Um, Ipso is still relatively new, but for the moment, you know, I, I don't think um, there is an immediate danger of such regulation, but bear in mind, you know, there are the forces out there that are calling for it will leap on any opportunity that arises to renew the call. So I don't, the, the danger is not passed. And I'm going to go out to the audience now, but I suppose that leads me to the question that a lot of countries have come, the answer that a lot of countries have come to in order to address this is not perhaps to have tighter regulation, but to say things like, well, we need misinformation and disinformation laws so that people can be assured that the information they're getting is trustworthy. Does any of the panel have a view on whether that's, what that might mean for a free press in the UK, a free media? All gone very quiet. I think the direction of travel is, is that at some point, like to be a kite mark that you will say, We are signed up to a regulator mm -hmm. off web or whatever it is, and that will be the mark to, sh to distinguish between those who are trying hard to apply high editorial standards and subject to a code and the rest. So, I think that's probably likely to happen at, at some point. I doubt whether there's going to be significant statutory regulation I in the interim. There probably would be some means of self-regulation overseen by a, 
a, a larger regulator, but I think in the end, my view is that there will be cart marks to say this is a regular news organisation and this is one man in his bedroom putting out his thoughts. Which may also be accurate, but we can come back. Yeah, and... I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't, I mean, I agree with John that actually the answer to fake news is reputable journalism where the reader can have confidence that it has been properly sourced, researched, legal, fact-checked, all of the professional standards which good newspapers employ. I mean, I don't think, I don't know who would award the kite mark. I mean, to some extent, it is going to be the readers who trust that. And you now I've debated fake news many times, and actually one of my defences of the BBC is that public service reporting and the BBC's reputational brand is so strong. That is the answer to fake news. You know, people may sort of enjoy reading stories which have very little resemblance to the truth, but as long as they know they can go somewhere else and read a story and be confident that it is as true as the reporter can possibly determine, that I think is the best response to fake news. Yes, and, and when NewsGuard was implemented and the Daily Mail fell out, that, that didn't go down so well. Um, I'm going to open it out now to questions. Uh, we have about 20 minutes, I think. Sorry? Five minutes. Five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't... I had Neil and Sue took up much too much time and we didn't start until gone four o'clock. So we will, you know, we will have some, some free expression. Uh, <laughs> If that's all right. Um, so we'll start here and go, go back, I think. Hi, Tracy de Groos, I chair Newsworks, uh, the industry's uh, arm to sort of champion what we do. Um, to the point John just mentioned there, with kite marking, I think who... Who decides or who, who, who does the kite marking is the critical question because there are some platforms in the UK at the moment that are trying to do it and they're lobbying the news industry quite hard to do it. What's your view on who, who should be doing the kite marking? We'll take, we'll take three or four questions and then we'll go. So if you just... Hello to everyone on the panel. Uh, Michelle Edwards, Wolf and Forest Echo. My question, or rather my set of concerns, um, I'd like to direct to Elizabeth. Now, the theme of today's conference is defending media freedom, and we're all in the room for that purpose. Um, unfortunately, my experience with the ICO um, has been less than satisfactory. Now, um, you're happy as an individual to make various different public pronouncements um, and about your high-profile investigations, WhatsApp, Facebook, etc. But when it comes to, you know, real bread and butter journalism, I find that the ICO is failing um, on an epic scale. Um, you made mention earlier that you're happy to step in, but that just isn't the experience of working journalists like myself. Um, earlier this year, I, well, so far this year, I think I've brought about 27 uh, various different examples of non-compliance by my local authority, a public body. And you, you, your staff constantly um, come back with this kind of very blasé attitude, despite me evidencing um, non-compliance on, on an epic scale. Um, and I just, I just think that the ICO is just asleep on the job um, and, and really not acting in our interests. Michelle, and, and a couple more, just... Okay. Yeah. Uh, hello, uh, Eleanor Mills. Um, I'm on the board of the Society of Editors. I'm the editor of the Sunday Times magazine. Um, I think that one of the things which is um, impacting media freedom, and certainly as an editor, is the knowledge that if you stray onto certain subjects, you get such a volley of online abuse and trolling and people attacking your advertisers that it's almost not worth going there um, as an editor. I mean, we all know the kind of things that I'm talking about, transgender being one of them. But there are quite a lot of, I think there are quite a lot of areas now where 
you, you, as an editor, you're quite wary to tread because of the kind of online reaction. And I think that that's something that we should be aware of when we're talking about media freedoms as a kind of self-censorship because of some particularly vociferous but small lobby groups. Um, and I'd be interested to hear what the panel have got to say about that. And if you just pass it, pass it behind. Hello, Rebecca Vincent from Reporters Without Borders. Um, our World Press Freedom Index was mentioned, so I just wanted to say I'd be happy to speak separately to anybody who would like to discuss the UK's poor ranking of 33rd out of 180 <laughs> countries. There are many reasons for that. Um, but some of them are legislative in nature. Some of these uh, problematic laws have been discussed by the panel. Um, and some of them are not always immediately, obviously, issues that impact press freedom. This is something we're working to address with John in the new uh, all-party parliamentary group on media freedom, but how can we better ensure that media itself are actually scrutinizing these laws for implications for journalism and press freedom? It often gets overlooked. I'm thinking of things earlier this year like the Crime Overseas Production Orders Act, uh, the Counterterrorism and Border Security Act, bills like this, as well as uh, historically things like the Investigatory Powers Act. Thank you. We'll take those four and then we'll come back out for um, another lot. I'm just going to ignore Ian making faces at me. Um, uh, so we've got kite marking who decides um, a specific question for Elizabeth on the ICO and then this issue which I, I th I'm really glad that Eleanor brought up on self-censorship and also how can we get the media to talk, to talk more about ourselves. Um, who wants to... John, do you want to... Do you want um. <laughs> I mean, the kite marking question, I entirely agree, um, is incredibly difficult, particularly in the middle of a general election campaign. The idea that you're going to have some sort of arbiter saying, yes, this is a reliable story or this isn't, um, in, in peacetime is bad enough, but when we're in the middle of a party political conflict, I mean, it, it's, I think it's impractical. As I said, I think the answer is for news outlets to prove themselves, to acquire a reputation for reliability, and that in itself will act as its own kite mark. And you know, there are plenty of publications represented in this room that do have that reputation. And they should tell their readers that if they want to read content that they can rely upon, then they should come there. Um, Self-censorship, which Eleanor raised. I mean, I go to look at election campaigns in a lot of different countries now. I'm on the OSCE, which does election monitoring. And when I visit a country, I always ask to speak to journalists. And actually, self-censorship is very widespread. It's one of the principal ways in which media is controlled because journalists are frightened of straying into certain territory. Now, it may be because they think if they do, they'll get harassed by the state or locked up. Um, but the trolling uh, threat and the abuse. Well, I mean, speaking as a politician, I mean, we, we are suffering it daily. I mean, obviously, my female colleagues in Parliament have had a terrible time. But the one thing that I would say is that we have successfully had a number of prosecutions. So where, where it becomes actual threats of physical violence or in some case even death threats, I mean, those have led to prosecutions and convictions. But a lot of it isn't actually um, death threats, it's just abuse. And it's easy to say, oh, well, it's just abuse, but actually it is pretty um, depressing, it's dispiriting, and it d I can quite understand uh, why journalists, as indeed politicians, say, I just don't want to put myself and my family through this. If this consequence is we're going to get this tidal wave of horrible comment. Um, and that is something which the social media platforms are beginning to address in terms of removing it. But oh, it, it's, again, you are going to be running into the question of where you draw the line between what is unacceptable and what is freedom of speech. So, I mean, it, it, it is part of the online harms debate which we are going to have to have in the next uh, few months. Elizabeth, do you just want to address that question? I will address Michelle's um, comment, but I also wanted to say, because you asked the question, <laughs> should journalists talk more about themselves and how do you continue to sell the value of freedom of expression? And there was an article in the front the Times yesterday, which was based on a survey of university students and how much they valued freedom of expression versus safety. And freedom of expression, again, is thinking in terms of the new generation on how important 
Mm. It is in comparison to other values. So I think there's a, there's a lot more that this community and other communities can do to make sure that the, the next generation and young people value freedom of expression. And to your, to your point, I'm very sorry to hear that we're not moving the mail for you because the ICO cares deeply about individual complaints as well as the big investigations. So I'm sure my staff can help me respond to your concerns and I, I will talk to you afterwards. Thank you. Martin, what about your feelings about either kite marking or, or this? How, how can journalists do more to sort of look into questions of the threats that exist to media freedom? Well, I think the one thing that we have got, well, uh, whether it's a uh, people paying for a printed newspaper or paying for a digital subscription or whatever, you've got the, the trust of your readers and people coming to you. So in a way, you know, somebody ranting about something on, on online and whether they would believe, you know, this misinformation over what we are what we are publishing, it, you, you would like to believe that we are, you know, we are already seen as being reputable by, you know, all our readers and, and uh, you know, and what we do. People will see us as a trusted source of, of information. In terms of um, the question about, you know, whether we are self-censoring because we're afraid of what's going to be put on social media. You know, there, there are plenty of Saturday nights when I put the paper to bed. I know when I wake up on a Sunday morning and check our, our Twitter that there'll be hundreds of abusive comments on comments that it's lies, it's not true, um, for, for a number of reasons, because, you, you, you know, he who shouts loudest or she who shouts loudest sometimes. Um, but I, I think, um, from, speaking for myself and from my own newspaper, the, um, we've got beyond the point of, of, of where we are afraid of what somebody's going to say to us on social media, because sometimes you just can't win anyway. You know, if the story is reputable and, you know, it, it, it's you're exposing something or, you know, whenever we do an investigation, we expose um, a criminal or a terrorist enterprise or whatever, their supporters will come on in their droves. So um, that would never put me off exposing that because if anything, I see sometimes um, trolling like that, that we're doing something right. Have you had to put an extra sort of security and support for your journalists? Yes, we would have journalists who have bulletproof windows, who have reinforced doors, who have locks at the bottom of their stairs. John, what about you? Is that something you're referring to your journalists? Uh, in, in my experience at IGM, we have been able to deal with harassment and stalking for presenters or reporters when it's happening physically. That there's, you can pursue prosecutions and that has happened. When it comes to online trolls or social media, it's more difficult. It, 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 I've noticed that the politicians are now going on the front foot on this and the prosecutions are taking place. Maybe that will happen more with the, 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 in the journalists' side of things. My experience on that front is that we have dealt with the police, but it hasn't led to prosecution, not least that some of these individuals are not individuals. They're automatic or they're out of the jurisdiction. So it's very difficult for the police to pursue. But what we shouldn't do is just normalise it. We shouldn't just accept that that is the norm and there are certain subjects we're not going to touch because we're going to be subject to a torrent. It needs to be addressed. And I think with the, um, with the white paper and the uh, potential regulation to come, that will be part of it. In terms of the kite marking, there, I don't think there's any easy solution, but I think we do have to show some means to distinguish ourselves from the, the crowd, from the, from the mob. And I do think if you are... Uh, subject to a regulator like Ofcom or, or Ipso or any new statute, any new regulator which may be put forward by the um, through the white paper and so on, that would be a starting point. If you say you've, we do have a, a, a regulatory code, it doesn't necessarily have to be as comprehensive as Ofcom, but it's a, if it's to protect children and to um, prevent hate speech. That's the starting point as a code. And if you say that's what you subscribe to and we've got an internal system to, to deal with that, to take complaints and to look at each case on its own merits, that, may, that would be a start, wouldn't it? It would be better than what we've got at the moment, which is very unclear, very uh, lacking in any proper framework. So there's no easy answer, but we've got to tackle it because we cannot normalise a lack of freedom of expression. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. And in the spirit of free expression, I will take two more questions. There's a question here and a question over there, and then I promise I will stop. <laughs> Paul Conyu, media commentator. <clears throat> this is a question for the whole panel, but particularly perhaps for John W., given that he's currently not a sitting MP, but merely a candidate. 
Um, many of us feel that the decision by number 10 not to publish the parliamentary report on Russian meddling in British politics is wrong and against the public interest, especially ahead of a general election. I wonder whether John agrees with number 10 or with his erstwhile colleague Dominic Grieve. And, and also whether the panel have a general view on how the media should play the, Donald Trump's attempts to influence the outcome of the general election. We got all the way through this session without even <laughs> mentioning that, 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 those two words. You, you've just... You've just my, bingo, <coughs> my bingo has failed. Um, and a question over there, and then we'll, we'll um, ask the panel to wrap up. Uh, we'll go from the uh, NCTJ. I just wanted to pick up a point that Elizabeth made about the degree to which um, young people place value on uh, <coughs> media freedom. I wonder whether part of that apparent decline may be because media literacy seems to be seen through the prism of trust and the idea that you, know, you, you have to kind of scrutinise what you're reading and you either trust it or you don't. It's not seen through the prism of Actually, why is journalism important? <coughs> and what actually is it that journalists do? Um, and I think it, it's something that, that we're trying to address through some of our sort of careers of literature. But I think there is a, a general lack of understanding about what it is that a journalist does day to day and why that is important. So I'd, I just welcome the panel's views on that. OK, so we've got Russia, um, Trump, um, and the media literacy trust question. Don't all feel compelled to take all of those things John, you ask a specific question. Um, well, both number 10 and Dominic Grieve have an advantage over me in that they both know what the report contains, and I don't. Um, I haven't seen it. The ISC, the Intelligence Security Committee, is different to any other committee in Parliament. As you know, I chaired the Select Committee on Cultural Media and Sport for 10 years, but that is a committee which is appointed by Parliament and government has no control over what is published by a select committee. That is not the case with the Intelligence and Security Committee. The membership is approved by the government and before anything is published, it has to be checked by the government and that is a lengthy process. Now, I quite understand why people will say, well, in a general election, when a report is published about possible interference in the election, it would be desirable to get it out. But I, I don't want to say, am I on the side of number 10 or Dominic Grieve, because I don't know what is in it. Um, it may turn out, but actually not a lot is in it. I don't believe there is... I, I certainly think Russia has been trying to um, manipulate elections by feeding out stories from bots, you know, based in some building in downtown Moscow. But I don't actually think it's had a great effect. But you know, I listened to Hillary Clinton, who also seems to be interfering in the British general election this morning. Um, I think it does raise, inevitably, uh, suspicions if the report is not published. But it may turn out when it is eventually, and obviously it will be, but it doesn't amount to uh, as much as people suspect. Um, I wanted just to come back also to Rebecca, who I didn't... Um, answer when she was talking about the Media Freedom Group and monitoring all the legislation that goes through Parliament. And I shall now do a shameless bit of sort of grovelling and say that actually the organisations that are very good at alerting MPs are firstly the Society of Editors and you know, representatives of the media industry and secondly organisations like yours and Rebecca's, our Index and RSF. So as long as you know, there are MPs, and I hope I am one, who will speak out if I am concerned that a measure going through Parliament is going to impact on freedom of expression and media freedom, but we do rely upon your organisations to tell us when that is happening. And actually that has happened, and we've managed to achieve some good changes in the past, and I hope we'll continue. Do any of the panel want to pick up any of those other things? I, put, I think that point, last point about do people have a sufficient understanding of what journalism is and what we do, is that... I, I, it's, that's very interesting. It, it goes back to something that came up on one of the um, panels earlier about you know, getting more young people involved in, 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 into journalism and getting that they don't want to, you know, going right back to schools and careers and things like that. I think that... Um, it's not a sexy career seen as anymore for you know young people to maybe get involved in, and they don't really know what you know. They, if they don't know what we go out and do, they you know they just see the finished product, whether it's on TV, online, or in print. And 
you know, I was, I was quite surprised that people, you know, I, if I understood the person who asked the question, I don't worry, um, right, that you, you think that younger people don't understand what, what a journalist does in their day-to-day -day job? It was, but I find that surprising because I think, I would like to think people would understand by and large what we do because you know, the, wor the work of journalists, journalists and reputable journalists is everywhere. I think on the sexy job um, <clears throat> comment, I think that's a good time to end really and send everybody off for a drink. Um, thank you very much to the Society of Editors. Thank you very much to our panellists and let's go out and defend media freedom. Thank yeah, you. Yeah.